engineering. Oh, okay. And as a black professor in engineering, there's only about um, 200 or so in academia if you're looking at tenure track. So there's just not a lot of us. So we have to wear a lot of hats. So my talk today is going to be about those intersections and how I use those to do several things in engineering. So first about the intersectionality, Richard Boyer states that the work of the process for it may be separated into four separate yet also overlapping functions, including the scholarship of discovery, integration, application, and teaching. He proposes that there must be a more inclusive view of scholarship that is a synthesis of research, practicing, and teaching. I am a roboticist, but I'm also an electrical engineer. So I do coding, I do programming, but I also do robotics outreach. So what I like to say is that I bring robotics and STEM to people and I bring people to robotics and STEM. And a big part of me doing that is because I want to diversify the engineering profession. So I do a lot of work in the community as well as on social media. So I have taken the hashtag nowhere feminist to kind of represent what I say here about this intersectionality of, I have to be more than just an engineering professor because there's just so much that needs to be done in the STEM Academy. And of course I have to add my handle at the bottom in case you'd like to follow me. It's DRCA Barry on Instagram and Twitter. So because of this intersectionality, my robotics bleeds over into everything I do. So here I show you some images of the different ways that I do robotics. So this top image here is me teaching some of my freshman women how to code a robot in their engineering design course. This middle one is me doing a STEM workshop for middle school girls, encouraging them to get into coding and STEM as well as robotics, of course. And over here, I've been a first robotics judge mentor, as well as an organizer of events for several years. And so that's where I won the Volunteer Year Award. And of course, I cannot give back to my community without also growing it in my family. So I'm also a mentor for the First Lego League, which is an all Girl Scouts game of girls, which is my daughter's um, robotics team down here at the bottom. And up here, this is an image of some old graduates and doing a little bit of robotics research as well. So this intersectionality of who I am has to be encapsulated in everything that I do with my life. So today is going to be a summary of the different ways in which I use this throughout my career. And it's going to be a journey trajectory from my more technical beginnings in robotics to where I am today. So human-robot interaction is where I started my technical journey. When I graduated from Georgia Tech, my first job was at Ford Motor Company in Michigan. I was a controls engineer and I worked on the control line for programmable logical controllers in industrial robotics. So I knew I wanted to go to graduate school and get my PhD in robotics because I had never had a black engineering professor or a black woman engineering professor. And I was like, man, this is not a very diverse field that I signed up for. So I guess I'm gonna have to join it because I have to show that engineering can be diverse and friendly and warm and intersectional and that it has to break out of that Dilbert mode, you know, that MacGyver mode that everyone sees when they think engineer. So I started that journey when in graduate school with the study of human robot interaction, which is a field that is to study and understand how robots interact with humans and to develop these principles to allow natural and effective communication between humans and robots. And the great thing about it is it was multidisciplinary. So once again, that intersectional perspectives coming in because human robot interaction requires computer scientists, electrical engineers, computer engineers, software engineers, cognitive scientists, social um, informatics, all of that, mechanical engineering, human computer interaction. So I had to touch on all of these. That was one of the first things I found when I arrived at Ford is they're like, you're an electrical engineer, but we don't work in silos here. So you need to go to learn more about mechanical engineering. There is no getting a discipline degree anymore where you don't need to understand how it intersects and interacts with other disciplines as well. So here's a little bit of a screenshot from my PhD work. So I had to design a human robot interface that was going to be usable by a novice. So what I did was I had a robot and I designed an interface and users had to determine where the robot was in the world, what the robot saw and what kind of decisions the robot should make. And the way that I did this is I had to do a user study and the participants could not be 
typical video game players or college students, et cetera. So I had people like my 70 year old mother, um, people who were walking by the engineering building on a warm day, come in and try it out. Because if robots are going to someday potentially be ubiquitous in society, we have to learn how everyday humans are gonna interact with them. We have to get past that uncanny valley of being uncomfortable and get to the point that someone is comfortable having Rosie cleaning their house or having a robot tutoring their kid on their homework. So that's where my start was in technical human robot interaction. And my biggest thing was designing the software and the studies for this experiment. From there, I have transitioned a little bit into robots for society. I now do more work with Indiana University, Dr. Selma Sabanovic, which is how I met Marlena, because that was um, her um, PhD advisor at the time, and looking at how people can interact with robots, like how they could recognize common human behaviors, how you can use them with students, with kids, et cetera. So this is a video down here, and it looks like I was trying to get it to play. I'm not sure it's going to cooperate because the play button never came up. Let's see if this one comes up. Um, um, I will check the chat. And if you can't see that, please let me know. What's your name? We're still seeing your PowerPoint presentation rather than the video. OK, thank you so much for letting me know that. Um, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a different screen just for a second. I just want to show just a little bit of, of where the research in social robotics is going. I'm going to get my slides back up, so just a moment. If we don't have technical difficulties, we're not doing it right. Always remember that. Um, so of course it doesn't remember where I left off because it doesn't love me. Um, so I shall go back here. So that's where I'm moving to now is more how to design systems that um, people can use in a more natural setting. So I'm working with people outside of my discipline in order to do that. And this interaction quality is of course dependent on the quality of perception and that perception is dependent upon sensors. And so of course, people not naturally have those senses that help them interact naturally with the world, but robots do not. So you have to have these ways for them to express emotion so that you can be comfortable working with them as companions or teachers or healthcare assistants. So the way that I start my journey with my students is in freshman design. So the cool thing about the multidisciplinary aspect of robotics is that I can integrate that into every course. So for our freshmen, we do it by having them design a system to meet a mission, and then they have to do a competition every year. So I'm gonna show a little bit of an excerpt from one of our, our competitions. Welcome to the Monster Mash. So one of the things I have found is that when I talk about first robotics and robotics in general and competitions is I hear a lot, oh, female students don't like that. Um, female students are turned off by competitions. They don't like that. And you know, they're, they're not really big into that chest bumping kind of thing. And what I have found is my female students are just as excited as my male students. It's really about how you manage the teams how you present the challenges and that they know they are supported. I would have loved to have been in engineering class when I was an undergraduate, where I knew the female students were, or the minority students were just as well appreciated and respected as everyone else. And that they had a professor who was excited to know their name and made this interesting. It's amazing I became an engineer because my undergraduate experience was not that. So everything I do as an educator is to almost negate out what I learned and go, okay, what's the opposite of how they did it? I wanna do it the other way. 
So here I, I, I show the multidisciplinary intersections of mobile robotics. And of course there's many more, um, but the cool thing about it is that my school, not only do they not get these degrees in silos because in order to get a robotics degree at my school, you have to take courses, even if you're an electrical engineer in coding in mechanical engineering and kinematics. They say a lot that computer scientists don't like to touch any hardware, only code. You cannot be a roboticist and not touch hardware. So they all come together in a multidisciplinary scene design project, which replicates that real world experience so that they can see that when they do graduate, you're never gonna go anywhere and say, hey, I wanna work with all the MEs. No, you gotta speak the language over the cubicle wall to all of your colleagues as well. So I won't show this full one, but here's a little bit of my senior class. So I showed you my freshmen and these are my seniors. So these are now students who are getting a robotics minor. So they're robotics all day. They totally drunk the Kool-Aid. So what we do with them is we create a control architecture to take the robot from being a little baby, to have the intelligence of about a three-year-old. And so that means it now recognizes walls and obstacles. It knows to follow them and not to hit them. It can plan a path from point A to point B. It can follow lines, it can follow the light. And it really shows that they, they do this in an entire quarter and it, 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 it helps them to see the difficulty in robotics and that it's not quite as simple as what you see on TV. A lot of times that is computer graphic, that's not reality yet. And coding a robot to do even some of the most simple things is not quite as simple as you might think. So. This is obstacle avoidance and the robot recognizing when it's at a dead end, when it needs to make turns, when it needs to go around the corner, et cetera. I'll skip this one a little bit. So they have to also do light tracking. So robots need to do, um, it's called Breitenberg vehicles. Um, and this was to examine um, animal light behavior, like the love of light, the fear of light, understanding how to make priorities. Like, is it more important for me to go to the light or to follow this wall? And here's May solving. Can the robot figure out how to drive itself home? So these are the kind of things we do with the students and they do this on multidisciplinary teams. So I teach this to students, some who have only programmed in MATLAB, some who are software engineering majors. So they have to learn how to speak the same language to each other, even though their prerequisite skills are not the same. So I like to say, I still do human robot interaction work even with my students, as I examine how they work on a multidisciplinary team where they don't all necessarily have the same interest or the same skill sets. So here's another one. This is one of my graduate students. So because I have to master how to teach these subjects to students of various degrees, and because Rose Holman is primarily undergraduate, I don't have a lot of graduate students, so I also have to teach my undergraduates how to do research for my professional development. A lot of times their work is in designing things that I can then take back to the class. So in this video, this student is showing how he built a robot from the ground up that was modular hey enough everyone, this project to be coded is in multiple robot languages robot using multiple interfaces. Project. So it could be programmed with an iPad, it could be programmed with a phone, it could be programmed with a computer. So now I don't have to worry about my students having different skills anymore. I can give them the same robot, and no matter the what, third part came of up with the flexibility for them to be able to use it. Try to go past like the. So he's explaining how he made all those behaviors I just showed you in that previous video, with, on this mo this modular platform that would be more plug and play for any user. So one of the challenges that I discussed is now that we have this great tool, the robot, to diversify the field. Um, what are some other ways we can bring students in? So I wanted to talk about next, Rose Building Undergraduate Diversity, which is a program I started in 2009 with a colleague and it was an NSF STEM grant for $600,000. It was started in electrical engineering because there were several years in our department, there was not one woman that went across the stage during graduation and maybe one or two men. The sad part about that is I graduated over 20 years ago and in class there were one or two women and one or two, I'm sorry, not one or two um, minorities and one or two women, I misspoke, I apologize. There were one or two women and one or two minority students in class. So we started this program in order to increase the number of women, minoritized and marginalized populations pursuing degrees in ECE, computer science and software engineering. Those were the departments with the least number enrolled at our school. So that's why we chose those two. 
And in this program, we offered scholarships, we encouraged internships, research experiences, as well as study abroad opportunities. We had workshops, seminars, networking, mentoring, and community building. And we also now have Rosebud interns because we learned a big part of this program is leadership. We don't just want to bring them on campus and say, tick, check off, we got our numbers up. We want them being in leadership positions. This program has now been in existence for 11 years. So what we're most proud of is that members of our organization are now the presidents of their sororities, um, the class president, the IEEE presidents and vice presidents. So they understood that part of community building was not just coming to campus and having a cohort amongst yourselves, but then going out and being seen and visible on campus to understand the importance of diversity. So I wanted to share this with you. One of the ways that we wanted to continue the program and some of the students came up with this, that's what I'm most proud of, is they said, we need to start giving back. So they designed the Spark Design Competition, which is a high school engineering competition that we hold every year, other than this year because of COVID. And we use this to recruit more students to Rose Holman as well as to the Rose Building Undergraduate Diversity Program. And SPARC was because it was started in the Electrical Engineering Department. The SPARC is also an acronym, Student Projects Advocating Resourceful Knowledge. The students came up with that. So I want to show you a little bit of a video from one of our SPARC competitions as well. This is the Rosebud Spark Design Competition. Aww. Aww. <laughs> and it's really to introduce the high school students to the design process into engineering. We get high school students, team them up together, sometimes with college students. Each part of the competition requires them to either maybe tinker with a printed circuit board, maybe they need to write a little bit of code, maybe they need to wire things together. Micro bit kits were donated from Spark Fund. So a micro bit is like a little microcontroller or a baby computer, and they're building an electronic circuit and they're programming it with the software. And so the final design challenge is they have to design some kind of game using the electronics and all the tools that they have on their table. The hope is they learn something about computer science and they also get a sense of what Rose Hallman is, what type of school we are, what type of projects we do here. So we decided to do like a pinball setup. So it's thrown up and then there are different like obstacles that will make sounds when it's hit and the lights will go off. And we also have the flickers so that you can keep the ball in motion and there's a little gold post for when it actually falls through. And this is probably some of the best engineering hands-on experience you can get prior to going into college. I was just kind of forced into it as far as, oh, you like math and science, engineering is a good fit. Uh, okay, engineering sounds like it's a good fit. So when you get the hands-on experience of you get a design problem and you actually have to make it, you get to see that engineering design process and you get a taste for what that's like before you have to make that decision of what you want to study in school. When I was younger, my thing was Legos. Now you get to do it with microcontrollers and lights and buzzers and turning things on and making things spark and fly and all of that. Learning that you can create something with your own hands and you don't need an adult to help you to write a program or to help you build a circuit. You can do it all yourself. It's pretty cool. So um, I just wanted to check the time. So um, yeah, going back. So that's the Rosebud program. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, some of our successes. So since that program has been started in 2009, we have seen that in, now, now the program is only for electrical um, and computer engineering and computer science and software engineering, but admissions has reached out to us and told us that because of the success of that program, they saw enrollment for women increase in, at the university as a whole. And as of 2015, it had reached 20, 24% in the freshman class. And I believe the most recent, recent freshman class may even be up to 30%. The other thing that we have noticed is that now um, there has been other programs similar to Rosebud established on campus. At the time that me and my colleague created this program, we had um, some people come to us and go, when I was a woman in engineering, I just pulled myself up by the bootstraps. I didn't need all these special programs. And now some of those same people are coming back to us and asking, tell us what you did, tell us your secret. And really it just took a couple of faculty who were really invested in the success of some students and were willing to be mentors for them and role models for them and coach them through the interview process. So some of the seminars we have is dressing for success. How do you interview for a job? How do you do an elevator pitch? Let's fix your resume. And they have classes where they learn these things as well. But it's really cool to be able to go in a professor's office and have those conversations. I've had students come in my office and go, I'm debating between this job offer or this one. 
or going to this co-op versus this internship, what do you think? And the students get over that intimidation of being around a professor and just talking about those life decisions. We also have peer mentors and alumni mentors. So they're mentored not only by the rows, but upperclassmen about what classes to take and how is this class, but they're also mentored by graduates about now that you're a working engineer, what's that like? How was that transition? So we now um, have about 24 graduates overall and about 33 currently on campus. And most of them do end up staying in engineering, computer science, or going on to graduate school. And in fact, in that video you just saw, Zaria Robinson was a high schooler in that video. She is now a sophomore in mechanical engineering at Rose Hellman and vice president of the National Society of Black Engineers. So we like to see that where they're now stepping up into those leadership positions. So I'm now going to transition from the work I've done as a technical robotics cyst in human robot interaction, the way that I use robotics for my students, and the way that I use the STEM in order to diversify the academy from the perspective of a student to the work that started this summer. So I am on sabbatical. Um, I started my sabbatical in theory in, in June of this year, but because of the pandemic, I've actually been home since March. And my sabbatical goes through August of 2021. And my original goal for my sabbatical was going to be, and it still is, um, to work as a controls and automation engineer um, for a contractor for Eli Lilly. So I do that work, but then something happened in May that also transitioned my work to something else. And it was motivated by the death of George Floyd and the summer of Black Lives Matter protests, as well as the social justice movement. And about two weeks after that death, about one in June, the hashtag Black in the Ivory started trending on Twitter. And what that was is a lot of academics started posting about their experiences in the academy. They talked about microaggressions and, and the inequity of um, the double bind and marginalization and isolation and all of those type of things. And I remember looking at it going, it's interesting, I'm seeing all these people posting about their experiences. I don't see any engineers. I don't even see many STEM people at all. And then I had an epiphany. It's because we are so underrepresented in the academy that you know that it's immediately after you post something about your experience on social media, people, your colleagues at your institution would immediately know who you are. If I said I'm a black woman engineer, electrical engineer in the Midwest and I post something on Twitter, everybody would know it was me because I'm the only black woman faculty member on my campus. So I'm the only one in engineering at all. So I am in a listserv of black academics in STEM and people started saying, we feel like it's time for engineers to step up. It's time for us to do more than just celebrate our accomplishments in the academy and talk about our re research, our portfolio, our teaching and our service. It's time for us to make an impact on our world because of what we're seeing going on with social justice. And we are more than just our degrees. We're more than just PhDs. We're more than just our research and the papers we publish. So I'm now gonna share a little bit about the work we've been doing for Black in Engineering, thus the title of my talk. So Black in Engineering is a social justice movement and we have several different tenets. We have the message, the policy, education and awareness. We have a social media campaign. We have a call to action on our website. We do community engagement. We connect with allies. We do strategic planning and we do finance because we need to have financial support for the work that we do. One of the first things we did is we wanted to show and normalize that black engineers do speak and we speak about more than just our technical work. And we knew it was important for us to do this as a community. And so this video was released in um, early July and I'm going to share this with you as well. Everyone in this video is an engineering faculty member. I'm black with a PhD, but I still could have died by a knee. I am George Floyd. I've succeeded using my head, but I still could have been shot in bed. I am Breonna Taylor. 
I think teaching and learning is fun, but I could get killed while out on the run. I am Ahmaud Aubrey. I'm a hidden figure in STEM who puts my hood on like, like Trayvon. Trayvon. And can't be stopped like Sandra Bland. All racism I do condemn. I engineer like Imhotep, but my black skin I can't sidestep. I can't breathe. I'm Eric Garner. This is not a game. I'm Tamir Rice. What if I'm next? Then it's hashtag Denise R. Simmons. If it's hashtag Leroy Long, I am Laquan McDonald. I am Ayanna Stanley Jones. I am Walter Scott. I am Katherine Johnson, Philando Castile, Alberta Spruill, and Samuel DeBose. We will not be silent. It is our turn to have a say. So on behalf of the STEM community, this is what Black STEM faculty like us have to say. It says PhD outside of our office doors, but we still get mistaken for janitors. And we love our custodians. There's no hierarchy when it comes to Black labor. They allowed us to get where we are. Say something back to speak up and speak out. Then we get blacklisted or just get kicked out. Love to teach, only to get called bad names. Names they wouldn't own if you called them out. Love to do research. But it's only safe if we sell out. Don't research black or Or shout. shout. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. Black lives matter. 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 Black Black lives lives matter. So because of that, we thought the video garnered about 7,000 views online. So it became very popular. Um, And it was based upon one that was released by the NFL um, and the Major League Baseball um, that looked at and said, I don't know why engineers can't do this. And we did. So we created um, how to be an anti-racist institute on our website. And after we released that, I found this one online and I thought it went so well with the work that we did that I wanted to share it as well. And surgeryredesign.com created a graphic of how to become an anti-racist individual because it's really more than about saying, I'm not a racist, but what are you doing to combat racism? So here are these different levels and obviously everyone would start at the fear zone where I'm just trying to be comfortable. I try to avoid hard questions to learning about racism and what that means educating yourself about race and structural racism, whether that's reading a book or joining a community to discuss, and then moving into that growth zone where you now educate your peers about racism and how it harms professions. So then what the Black and Engineering Organization did is we made a call to action on our website and it's at blackengineeringandengineering.org. I cannot give you all the details here. It's pretty extensive. And we also have a place for allies to sign the call to action if you would like to do that. But the four overarching principles are attitude, clarity, institutional accountability, commitment, and resources. Attitude is first. You must decide that there is something on your campus that needs to be addressed and you cannot ignore that. And you have to be clear about what you're addressing. If it's anti-Black racism, you have to say that. You gotta disaggregate the data because the experiences of Black people, even Black women versus Black men, would not be the same as let's say Asian women or Asian men. There should be institutional accountability, which means you're keeping some type of record. So that if you make a commitment or you came out with a statement this summer after the George Floyd killing, a year from now, you should be able to report out on what has been done, what has been accomplished. And you cannot do anything without having that commitment and resources. In other words, put your money where your mouth is. So these are the overarching principles of how to become an anti-racist institution. And it obviously would also work for a department. Here are some of the recommendations that we have. How a historical education of what your institution has done, what it is doing, Um, and what has happened there. And despite what we've recently heard from um, the White House, you need to have implicit bias and diversity training, right? There should be some accountability and fundraising. Everything must flow from the top. You must have leadership and administration. You cannot delegate the diversity work on your campus to junior faculty or to postdocs 
PhD students, graduate students, or the minoritized and marginalized populations. You cannot ask those groups to come and fix the structures in a system that they did not create when they don't have that power on campus. You cannot ask junior faculty to do that when they also are trying to get promoted, get tenure, et cetera, be retained. You have to look at how policing is handled on campus as well as spending. Spending meaning if you're giving departments this requirement that they do this diversity work, then you have to also reward them for that. Maybe it's tied to line items or a budget. Same for faculty. If you're giving them research dollars for something and you're telling them they need to have some kind of diversity commitment, then maybe there should be some dollars attributed to things like recruiting diverse students to work on your projects, et cetera. Or for hiring diverse faculty. You also have to have disaggregation, especially in STEM, this is a challenge, which means if you're reporting on the number of historically minoritized students in your school, you cannot lump Asian students with the black, Hispanic or Latino students because Asian students are not historically marginalized in STEM. So you have to disaggregate that data so that people can really see what your goals are in your benchmarks. Tokenism, I think we all know what that is. As you can imagine, you get one or two students or faculty on campus, but they're on all your brochures, all your flyers. So they give people a um, unrealistic representation of what the diversity on campus looks like. And there's also recommendations for faculty, staff, and students, but that's on the website and I won't go into that because I want to make sure we have time for questions. So the great thing I have talked about is that robotics is multidisciplinary. So it draws students from all these disciplines, but it also is a great way for me to examine my intersectionality of doing all of these different things as a black woman in STEM, because I can't just be an engineer. I can't just be a professor, but I have to also consider the diversity in my field. And I have to also give back in order to address that. So in conclusion, I wanted to share a little bit about who I was as a person and how that informs what I do. And I wanted to put some of my contact information here if you want to reach out to me, um, my Twitter handle, my email, as well as the blackandengineering.org website that you can go to to see some of our content on our call to action. And also the Black Engineering Faculty Speak is now a YouTube channel. So we have several video videos where we um, amplify Black engineers in STEM and several playlists on that. And then I also have my personal um, website. So once again, I would like to thank um, the Department of Psychology, New Mexico State for having me speak. And I'm now ready to receive questions.